Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, myself and John and Tracy have been, you know, talking feverishly over the last couple of days with everything that's been going on along with the rest of the group. And it's certainly been a very painful move down um, with yesterday's Dow decline being the largest point total decline since 1987 and uh, the largest percentage decline since 1987 in one day, not the largest because in 1987, the Dow actually declined over 20% in one day. Uh, fear has t definitely taken hold. It can be seen by uh, some of the volatility indexes with the VIX at 72 yesterday, which is high. I think it hit 80 in 2008. I haven't seen that high since then. The fear and greed index, which is another sentiment indicator, is at two when it's ranges from zero to 100 with 100 being very, very positive and greedy and zero being extremely fearful. So we're near all time lows in that. Um, in addition, we've seen huge outflows from equity funds in the last three weeks through Wednesday. So this doesn't even include yesterday. We've seen about $47.5 billion pulled out of global stock-based mutual funds and ETFs. And bond funds have seen $26.2 billion in inflows in that same time. So there's definitely been a flight to safety and uh, fear has taken over. You know, yesterday was uh, maybe the beginning of capitulation, but we're not sure that it's the absolute bottom or that we won't test it again. I know this morning we're limit up on the futures and they open them, they'll work through that and see where we end the day. We could be very volatile back and forth today. People realign their percentages, equities and bonds and we had a large number of margin calls yesterday and people were selling the most liquid things. And that's when you looked at yesterday, there was no disparity between anything. Everything was negative. Even bonds were negative. We were seeing spreads widen and John will go into that in a little more detail. People were selling the most liquid things to cover margin calls and to get out of the market. That may be the beginning of the end, but we're not sure that we're there yet. So we're continuing to monitor that. Is this overblown? Maybe it is, but the uncertainty and the duration of what's going on here and the impact on the economy leads people to be hesitant to anything that they're doing. So we're continuing to monitor that. You know, as we look at this, why is all this happening? And as we all know, it's really the coronavirus. The fear and the uncertainty around it, I think we've really hit that point where we've hit the pandemic level was named from a global standpoint. We had all sporting events that canceled. We've had Disney World closed down starting this weekend, Disneyland closing down, Broadway's closing down. It's really they're trying to stem the tide of the virus being spread, and that's just led to this extreme fear. And what that does, though, with that extreme fear is it's also slowing down the economy. You know, people don't really worry about team owners of the NBA or the players of the NBA suffering, but what it really is going to impact is all the workers that support those services and all the things that have been closed down. You know, it goes from the people who work at the venue to the people who work at the hotels where people stay, the airline industry, you know, even the Uber and transport services, you know, the people take back and forth to games or to Broadway or whatever. If this is just a two to three week thing, I think we'll move on fairly quickly. But who knows? We don't know what the impact is. If we look at how China and South Korea have worked through this, it seems that China hit a peak after about two or three weeks. Then they closed down, as they closed down the country. They're coming back online now. South Korea seems to have gotten ahead of it. But we're shutting down entire countries, France, Italy. So it's really a global event. We would say we'll probably have a recession. Will it be short? Depending on what happens, it probably will, because we're very strong going into this economic environment, people were employed, things were good, the economy was doing well. So we'll just have to see, but there has been a lot of fear out there. What can we do about it? I think we look at it, the bond markets responded. I think, John, do you want to step in and cover a little bit about the bond market? Well, the Federal Reserve of uh, our country is trying to lead the way to kind of ease the pain that's been in the bond market. It's not that, that they can do much, but what's happened in the bond market is there's been kind of a freeze, some extra risk, particularly when it comes to credit risk and liquidity risk. When you've got everybody trying to sell their securities, whether it's stocks or bonds, all at one time, it's kind of a bottleneck. So the Fed is stepping in and trying to ease the pain. Uh, they came in last week to uh, push interest rates down, particularly in the short end. And as such, they're not quite doing the job that they should be able to do because the market still has this risk tolerance that's pretty high right now. And because of that, liquidity, as I said, liquidity and credit are, are pretty bad right now. What I mean about credit, 
I'm talking about credit spreads, particularly instruments that aren't treasury. You know, you, you get compensated for taking on extra risk. We're, we're basically playing in the investment grade field. And as such, I've seen those double A type credits, those credit spreads have doubled over the course of the last week or so. Mortgages, which are usually pretty sound instruments, those things have doubled in the last week or so. And it's kind of interesting because obviously the, the 10 year yield got down to 31 basis points at the beginning of the week. And now we're closer to 92 basis points, but there was a surge of refi activity to a point where banks who were processing the mortgages weren't even answering their phones because they were getting so many inquiries. And as such, the yields or the spreads on those instruments started to increase. We also saw it in the, the junk bond arena, particularly because the energy sector is being hurt because of the low oil prices. There's a lot of small companies out there that issued debts in order to start pumping oil in, in those shale oil areas of the United States. And they are at risk because if oil prices are down, they're not collecting enough revenue in order to pay off their uh, debt service. And so those yield spreads widen out, almost doubling themselves. They were probably as low as 320 some basis points over the 10 year yield, and now they're over 700 basis points. So you can see the doubling there. So the Fed is trying to relieve some of that pressure. And, you know, I'm just looking at the market here right now. We have a Fed meeting next week. The Fed, according to the Fed Funds Futures, have a good chance of reducing rates by 100 basis points. That would probably bring our Fed funds target level, which right now is at one to one and a quarter to zero to 0.25. I'm, I'm not sure that's gonna do much. It's gonna be more psychological. Betsy was talking about how some of the long bonds sold off uh, yesterday in light of the uh, stock market falling off, particularly because I think there's a point where they're just trying to sell anything they can get. If you can sell something and you can sell it at a decent price, you sold it yesterday and the day before. And we saw that particularly in the bond market. Normally the, the bonds, the treasury bonds would have a very narrow spread between the bid and offer prices. That's between where you can buy it and sell it. You might see maybe a half point difference. I'm looking at the screens right now. I'm seeing as wide as five ticks, which are five thirty seconds of a point, which is pretty wide considering the liquidity that's supposed to be in the treasury market. Overnight, in the last couple of days, we've had other central banks coming into the marketplace, easing monetary policy, reducing rates. Um, I was kind of disappointed that the European Central Bank did not cut rates yesterday. They kind of jawboned it. I think Lagarde, who runs the uh, ECU, has probably realized she, she missed the chance in order to ease the marketplace a little bit. So uh, the Fed is going to continue to do what it can, promise to basically we call it the QE quantitative easing. They've come into the markets announcing yesterday that we're going to possibly do up to a trillion and a half dollars worth of purchases over the course of the next couple of weeks. Part of it is to relieve the short-term liquidity problems that's happening right now. But at the same time, I think they recognize that these credit spreads, particularly in the mortgages, are starting to widen out. So we hope we can start having them start buying those again in order to get those credit spreads to, to decrease. I'm still worried that if I don't see these credit spreads start to, to unwind or at least start to, to decrease, that we might be actually getting into a situation similar to 2008 where the credit markets kind of seize up. But uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I think the Fed is on top of it. They don't have much in ammunition, particularly because interest rates are so low right now. And somebody asked me just the other day, did I think the Fed would allow interest rates to go negative? Well, the market basically would move rates to negative, not the Fed. But I think that once the Fed does basically use up all their ammunition by moving the Fed funds rate down to close to zero, that we'll probably see some flight to quality into the short T-bill portion of the Treasury curve. And we may actually see some negative interest rates in the very short end, like up, up to three months. Tracy, do you want to cover a little bit about the equity markets and earnings expectations? Yeah, and I would just add to John, uh, listen to some things this morning. There's a lot of other, um, there's a number of other tools the Fed has. And it sounds to me what I heard this morning, and Mnuchin's going to be talking later today, they're on top of this already. They're kind of taking the playbook from 08, which is a good way to start. You know, this is not 2008 and 2009 all over again. This is totally different. That was almost looking like the global central banking system was completely going to collapse, and that is not the case. U.S. banks are in extremely good shape, and also we had the housing bubble. Remember, we had unemployment was taken off, homes are being foreclosed on, 
is a lot different. Um, consumers in pretty good shape right now, so I won't go into all the economics, but I kind of thought about it. And, you know, this is probably something that is maybe between the 9-11 situation and the 2008 situation. But, of course, this is going to be more severe than 2011 because I think the biggest concern the market is, and I'll get into the earnings, is that nobody knows. If we knew the duration and the extent of this shutdown and coronavirus, you could make some decisions on, you know, is the market properly priced where it is today? That's what investors are trying to figure out right now. Uh, what, what should the proper level be for the S&P 500 once we come out of this? And a lot of companies are coming out. They can't give you any guidance going forward, which is probably understandable. So I think the markets are definitely trying to price that in. And earnings are going to be a huge question mark, particularly in the first half of this year. So that's where a lot of the fear is coming in. You know, is, is this thing overblown? And I wrote, maybe the coronavirus situation is, but the market trying to figure out what the realistic levels for stocks and earnings is probably not overblown. I mean, this is a, an exogenous event that we really don't have a playbook for. Um, but I do think the um, next to 1987, and some of us were there sitting uh, in the office watching the S&P go down 22% in one day, and steepest decline in stocks we've seen since 1987. This has basically happened over about two weeks. You know, we've said all along we felt we were due for maybe a 5 to 10% correction. The market was ahead of itself. Um, now the question is, you know, what is a reasonable correction? Um, Betsy mentioned that said, is this the beginning of the end? I, it was, she didn't mean the beginning and the end of the market. She meant, you know, are we seeing capitulation that maybe this is getting near the bottom of the selling? I don't know if we're there yet, but a lot of damage has been done. Uh, a lot of the selling has already been done. We may, you know, maybe it goes a little bit lower, um, but, you know, what we're going to be looking at is, um, you know, when we want to step in and start picking away uh, and increase our equity exposure, sell some bonds, increase equity. And we're probably getting closer to that point. The market is you know, limit up this morning, we're gonna have a rebound. Then you'll probably see the sellers come in that want it, still wanna get out and they'll probably take it back down again. It's only up 3% as of right now and it was up five. But I think the thing we have to remember as we're talking to our clients, when you get in these bear markets or any huge correction like this, the bottoming is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. One recovery, you know, we're going to have some, some positive recoveries, but we're likely going to maybe retest the low that we saw yesterday if that was the low. Um, it's too early to decide if that's it. We may start to piece in a little bit, maybe put a couple percent in equity, you know, mark it down 26% on the S&P. You start waiting in. You don't put it all to work all at once. This is going to process going to take several months, and it's not going to come right back. Um, but we do think there's some opportunity out there as we move forward. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and I think the other thing to, you know, when we're talking to clients, um, and I refer to a question was asked on, you know, what point do you pair back on equity holdings? Well, this happens so fast and everybody's trying to make heads or tails out of coronavirus. But I think what we need to tell clients too is, we cut back on equities three times last year. We went overweight, went back to neutral, went overweight, went back to neutral. And we did it again in January this year. So where did that money go? That money cut back and it went into the bond market and the merger fund, which has held up very well. So we have actually cut back on equity over the last year uh, as it has run up. But bonds seem to be getting overvalued. Stocks seem to be being oversold, but they can continue to get oversold. So it's time now to, I think, two things. One, you know, if you look at a 50-50 portfolio or 60% stock portfolio, we're probably 10% underweight equity. We're going to gradually move back into equity. So I would say if you got clients who are really worried, are they in the right asset allocation? Those people, maybe the pullback on equity, you know, maybe a 60% stock portfolio, maybe there should be a 50. So that's somebody we might want to change the allocation on right now so that we're not adding back into equity. And if we're wrong um, and the market goes down again, they're not going to be too upset. So really focusing on what is that proper asset allocation is very important. Or if you have, have clients averaging in, you know, starting to put some money to work right now makes a heck of a lot of sense. 
not all of it, but beginning to pick away at it. You know, we really have not had a major bear market since 2008. Over the last 50 years, there's been 14 bear markets. So that's roughly a bear market every 3.6 years. The median decline of that bear, those bear markets are 28 to 29%. We're near that, so this is comparable to a bear market. Um, but remember, over that 50-year period, the average return in stocks, including all those bear markets, is a little over 10%. It doubles every roughly every seven years. I think this is a little different because we haven't had that extreme. I would say we've had two bear markets. You know, we had a bear market in 2011, um, European debt crisis. We were down about 20%. And if you look at 2018, uh, that was that was close enough, 19.6. 2016 was about a 15% drop, but yeah, this is more severe. And like I said, we don't know if this is over yet. The bottoming is a process and that's what we're looking at. But there are indicators that you watch, the VIX, you know, some of these sentiment indicators that are at the lowest level since 2008 and some even lower. So there's no doubt the panic is set in. If we aren't at capitulation, we're probably close. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll kind of stop talking. But the biggest thing is, we got to figure out where earnings are, and the market is going to be unsettled by that. And the reason I say we have a few months, you know, for this thing to work out, we have to get through this closing process, a closing economy down, and get people back to work. Then the question is, is it going to start to increase again? You know, the coronavirus. That's going to be a concern. So those are those are still uncertainties that aren't going to go away. So I think it's not going to shoot right back up. But we'd like to see a process that stabilizes and a bottoming process put in place. The other thing that's out there is what's the government going to do with this? And I think the speech the other night by the president did not call markets at all. Well, overnight, I think Pelosi had stated that they were getting closer to a deal. This morning, Mnuchin was on TV saying that they're working very closely together and looking at ways to support this. So I think if we get a fiscal move from the government yes. side, it will give some support to the market. It doesn't mean it's the end. As Tracy said, it's a bottoming process. We have to work through it. But, you know, you have to put a floor in, and we do have to think about, you know, where we're at, what's going to happen. And I don't think we're going to have a V-shaped recovery in the equity market, and I think John or Tracy would agree with that. It's because it is the uncertainty, and we're not going to know what earnings are and what the overall impact is of shutting down or basically shutting down an economy for two to four weeks when you look at it. Some steps we've taken, you know, yesterday we did sell our Oakmark position. Really to get into why we did that, we have been talking for the last two weeks how we want to position when we want to add to the portfolios and add into equities. The Oakmark portfolio was going to be coming out no matter what, and we figured it's time to do it. Why is it coming out? It has lagged its peer group. It doesn't perform well in up markets. It doesn't perform well in down markets. It's not doing what we want it to do. We have another option out there. For the time being, we just moved it to cash until we decide how we want to rebalance and when we want to start that process. But that is the primary reason. It's not meeting our expectations. It was going to be removed from the portfolios no matter what in the next move. And um, just so you know that, uh, as you're talking to clients and they wonder why we made that change, that we have been talking about how we're going to add to the portfolios, how we want to be structured, you know, how we're going to do it. We had talked about doing you know, a couple percent here, a couple percent there. We're still in that process. Uh, I would say we're not ready to make that move. It might happen in the next week, depending on what happens. It could be two weeks. As we do that, we will send out notices to everyone. We'll let you know what's going on, why we're doing it. But, you know, it is a process. As Tracy said, it's a bottoming process. You know, the credit markets, as John said, they have to, we have to make sure they're working because if credit markets don't work, equity markets don't work, and the economy doesn't work. So, we need to make sure all these things are somewhat in order. We can't say we will not call the exact bottom. We don't promise we're going to call the exact bottom, uh, but we are monitoring signs of when the bottoming process is starting. You know, when you look at the yeah. market, the small thing started up, limit up over 5%, and the Dow is only up 2.5% right now. So there will be some buys and sells. It could be a very volatile day on top of it being, you know, Friday the 13th. Uh, so we're going to monitor that, and we are looking at that. John and Tracy, do you have any other comments to add? Yeah, I would just say you know, nobody can nobody can call a bottom. Uh, it, it's impossible. And there's a question on here. Somebody asked, 
are you personally investing or did you liquidate from equities? I, I'm assuming they're asking us individually that. Um, I can't pick a bottom, but I did have some cash. I put some cash in on Monday. There's a question that came in here. What are thoughts on a recession? I think we're going to have one, a short one it may be. But I think it's going to be short and shallow. It's not going to be a deep recession like 08. Unless something un, un, you know, unexpected happens, but it's probably not going to be a deep one. And the 08 one was a deep one, and that was due to leverage and housing. Mm -hmm. And leverage is a much harder type of recession to come out of when it's caused by that than it is the type of recession that we would anticipate right now is really just kind of closing down an economy for two to four weeks people getting back in the circuit, people still have demand. They're not as stretched as they were coming out of 2008. I think our government officials have learned a lot from 2008. They were kind of slow to react, particularly, you know, when it came to the congressional problems that they had trying to pass the, the major bills back then. I think now we, we have to see more of a coordinated effort between basically Washington, the Congress, President, and monetary policy in order to get the best bang for their buck for the recovery. Because what we're doing is probably kind of slowing down the magnitude of this slowdown. I mean, this is not just us slowing down. This is a global slowdown. And I'm not saying everything is being shut down per se, but it is going to affect us. Monetary policy will help the recovery. It's not going to help it stop everything from falling apart. It's not a cure, but it's there to help them when we do get out of this funk, that, uh, when we start seeing you know, lesser infections um, in, the, in both globe and the United States. Lower interest rates will give that base for the, the recovery going forward, which should, as uh, I think we all kind of agree here, the three of us, three, if we, when we do get this recession, if we get one, it's going to be a smaller one, and hopefully we're going to get a quick recovery. Bessie, I have one more thing here. You know, we can't pick a bottom. You've got to know your client. I had a client yesterday. I thought he's going to sell. We talked a little bit, and he's like, you know, I don't need the money right now. Let's not. So we didn't. But something to remember here, um, I, I pulled this from Invesco. You know, we talk about the market moves. Most of your market moves are in a in very few days of the year. So you got to you, you can't time it. You got to be invested. But interesting, half of the market's best days in history have happened during bear markets. So when these things sell off big, some of those upward moves are huge. And that's what we talked about yesterday. He's like, well, I don't want to really miss the upward move. I'm like, I can't, you know, we can't tell you how much downside there is, but there could be significant upside. So, yeah, it just because we're in, quote, a bear market doesn't mean you can't have really strong upward moves in the market. And you need to be there to take advantage of them. And then 30% of those best days have happened the first two months of a recovery. The problem is we don't know when that first month recovery is. So just, right. you know, know your client, have the right allocation, but probably not the best time to, to you know to liquidate. So I would say okay. in summary, we're um, you know still hesitant to to say we've hit a bottom, but we think we're closer to it than we were probably a month and four weeks ago when we were hitting all time highs. And we will be moving into the market gradually as we see fit. We will keep everyone informed. If clients have questions and you need to include us on calls, feel free to contact us. We're all available. So if you do have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. We will be glad to answer them. We're always at your disposal. And we know that it's a volatile time for clients and assure them that we are attempting to stay on top of it as much as possible. It's a moving target and our expertise is here. Uh, John, Tracy, and the rest of the staff, Steve, Dan, Michelle, we're all in the assistant portfolio managers. They're all on top of it and can um, be open to talk with clients. Thank you, everyone, for taking time this morning. Have a great Friday.